Call the meeting to order. Please rise for a moment of silence and salute to the flag. Good evening and welcome to the February 5th, 2020 committee meeting with action for the North Hills Board of Education. I would like to announce that the board held an executive session at the administrative center prior to this meeting to discuss personnel and legal matters. Um, before we move on to board comments, I wanted to acknowledge a few of our um, elected uh, representatives that we have invited to attend our board meeting this evening. Um, to, uh, to watch our turnkey tax presentation. So from Westview, we have uh, Bruce Fromlech and Kim Steele. And from Ross, we have commissioners Jeremy Schaefer, Sarah Puesca, Dan DeMarco, and Bill McKellar. Thank you all very much for taking the time to attend this evening. Um, and I just have a couple of very brief comments. First, I wanted to congratulate the cast of The Little Mermaid Junior at the middle school on an amazing run this weekend. I, I think everybody from the board um, attended and we all just really enjoyed it. It was a delight to watch. And um, this morning, several board members, including myself, were judges at the Westview Science Fair. And I also want to congratulate those kids. And I think that's a wonderful event. And it's so great that the PTA sponsors that. This was their 26th year. So I really enjoyed that. Um, and I'll open it up to any other comments from other board members now. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, last week I was able to attend. Uh, Dr. Manarino's second cup of coffee, and there were a lot of great community conversations, and, and it was well attended. Uh, Dr. Manarino, do you just want to discuss what, some of the few things that were talked about between yourself and the community? Yeah, we um, we had some time to talk about flexible instructional days and what that looks like in the event we would have to go in that direction. We are all hoping we don't have to. Um, there was a tremendous amount of work that went into that, and it's one of those projects that I hope we never have to use. But um, if we do, we're prepared for it, and uh, we're ready to go. So. That was, you know, one of the major points of conversation. We also talked about the transition of sixth grade to the middle school and what some of those things are going to look like, the classrooms and the schedules. Um, and then we talked quite a bit about charter school legislation, which is something when we get to tonight, there is actually a resolution on this agenda talking about uh, our support for charter school reform and that uh, this district has for a, over a decade had a strong cyber school program in and of itself. We have an, our own online academy, um, but yet we continue to pay a high price tag for those families that choose to take their cyber charter school education elsewhere. And so it's something that we have been uh, talking about at this level for a long, long time, and hopefully that there is some traction in Harrisburg to get some changes made that will bring some of those wasted dollars, in my opinion, back to the North Hill School District. And so you're going to see a resolution tonight that talks about that. So we had a conversation with community members about charter schools and charter school legislation, about our online academy and the things that we offer students. It was, it was really nice. I'm glad we resurrected that. I sent Allie a text. Uh, this was one of Allie's ideas um, to get me back out there doing second cup of coffee. And I'm really glad that I did. Um, and as I said to them before, we have another one scheduled in March and that the plan is to have four um, next school year just as we did in the past. So um, stay tuned for those dates if you can make it great. We've also kicked the idea around back and forth to do it in the evening. Uh, I don't think we would call that second cup of coffee if we did it in the <laughs> evening. Uh, but the idea and the concept um, is still there for me to have an opportunity to sit without an agenda and talk to parents because there isn't one. And whenever I showed up, that was the first thing that I said. I have no agenda. What would you like to talk about? And um, and that's what was really nice about it, because it was an open forum, and we just had a candid conversation, which was great. Thanks. Um, I have two things, um, both around asking for public input. Um, this week is National School Counseling Week, so I want to give a big thank you to our counselors. Um, I know we all appreciate everything that they do. Um, and tied to that, um, a couple weeks ago, Governor Wolf uh, um, well, a month ago, he released his new plan, Reach Out PA, and it's to really focus on mental health, mental health across the Commonwealth. And he is just now asking for public feedback. So if you go Google Reach Out PA feedback, or um, 
one of his big things that he wants to focus on with this mental health initiative is giving schools the funding that they need um, to make sure that we are adequately staffed with counselors, social workers, and uh, school nurses. Um, so he's just asking for public input on that. So if anybody wants to go fill out the form about how important we think it is to have our mental health staff and our physical health staff in our schools, I think that that would be um, a really great thing for us to do. Um, and then the other thing is that a couple weeks ago, um, the USDA announced proposed changes to school meals. So the USDA runs our national school lunch program. And um, so in 2012, a new set of nutrition guidelines were passed for schools. And last year, the USDA began kind of rolling some of those nutritional guidelines back. And I, I bring this up because they're also asking for feedback on these new proposed changes. The, fee the public comment period ends on March 23rd. Um, last year, the rollbacks um, involved things like before districts could only sell non-fat flavored milk, now they're allowed to sell low fat, so we were allowed to add fat back into our flavored milk. Um, now, instead of having all grains be whole grain rich, only half have to be, and they delayed deadlines to lower sodium. Uh, this year, this year, the proposed, the proposed changes that they're asking for feedback on um, would allow schools to cut the amount of fruit included in breakfast served outside the cafeteria from one cup to half a cup. The remaining calories could be filled with sweet pastries and granola bars. For lunches, the proposals would allow schools to offer potatoes as a vegetable every day and gives them the flexibility to provide things such as pizza and burgers as a la carte items that students may choose over more nutritious meals nearly every day. Um, and I'll just, the American Heart Association did a big uh, press release on this, basically saying these changes are unnecessary, put children's health at risk. We adamantly oppose this rule. Um, so um, the good thing is that even if the USDA does roll back these nutritional guidelines, school districts do not have to follow them. So it's a, it's a decision we could make as a district if we want to go with the rollbacks or not. Um, but in the meantime, public comment period is open um, through the USDA until March 23rd. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? Okay, I'm now going to move on to public comments on agenda items only. And um, I would like to note that there'll be an opportunity after the turnkey tax presentation to make comments or ask questions if you have anything related to that specifically. Okay. Uh, I'd like to then hand the floor over to Jerry Muth. And Mark Schuster from Turnkey Taxes. Good evening. Um, currently, the North Hills School District Tax Office solely collects the business privilege tax and mercantile tax. It's basically a tax on the gross receipts of businesses that operate in Ross Township and Westview Borough. Historically, we have relied on pretty much word of mouth, um, manually looking through databases, um, the support of both the township and the borough to direct people when they come through their offices, contemplating opening businesses, to direct them to come to the tax office. Um, but basically, our way of building the registered um, taxpayer listing is pretty primitive, to be quite honest. We have uh, one position in the tax office that is responsible for the collections. We also have a person that is kind of a silent partner who has a passion for just driving around and looking and trying to find different businesses that we may not be aware of. And um, it has worked well, but quite frankly, we probably need a checkup. Um, there's probably a broader audience out there that we are not reaching. We've made efforts in the past to have an amnesty program back in 2015. Um, whether the program was too punitive, I don't know, but we only picked up probably 20 to 25 new businesses through that. Uh, opportunity. So again, we're probably due for having uh, an expansion of the way we look at and register taxpayers to broaden the tax revenues that we may have missed collecting in the past, but also in the future we would get the cash flows from those identified. Um, in recent years, we have been approached periodically by the Ross Township Commissioners in particular. They have suggested that we look at a gentleman who runs the turnkey taxes and we now have an appetite for that in the district, and we are looking to possibly invite Westview Borough, if they're interested as well, to have these services um, explored to see if we can improve revenues for tax collections. 
So I'd like to introduce Mark Schuster. He's the CEO of Turnkey Taxes. Good evening, folks. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. My name is Mark Schuster. I'm CEO and founder of Turnkey Taxes. Um, I am a software developer by trade. Um, I really, growing up, wanted to have nothing to do with taxes, and um, it's just that uh, there was a, uh, a need out there, and I was able to help solve it through my software. So let me just uh, take a step back and talk about, you know, Jerry was talking about primitive. I mean, he's, uh, you know, compared to some of the other collectors around the state, he's, they were actually up there, and um, they've done a fine job, but it's not anything to do with the existing systems. It's the entire process is broken because of the way data is collected. So in the personal world or in the corporate world, you have one system of record. You have one database of all the stuff you need, and it's called the credit bureaus. And you can't buy 10 homes in one day or 10 cars or you open up all the kinds of credit cards because you'd start flagging off this thing everyone pings that one database. Well, that doesn't work in local governments. When you move into a town, the first thing you do is go to the post office because you want your mail. They update their database. Then you go to Comcast and Verizon because you want your toys, and they up those, update those databases. You go to the water company, the sewer company, the light company. You probably even update your Giant Eagle and library card. Everybody knows that you're in Westview or in Ross Township, except the people that need your money to fund the community. So what I tried to do many years ago, back when I tried to save cent tax, long story, but we're trying to reverse that paradigm and increase the communication so when a brick and mortar business or, or any business moves into a town or a new resident moves into a town, uh, we can get them registered right away. And wouldn't it be grand sometime if you had one point of contact that somebody that came into town went to Jerry and said, hey, I'm a new business. And you can say, hey, I'll take care of everything for you. We'll be the database. We'll alert everybody else. So that brings us to the data because really what I'm trying to focus on and how I want to help is with the data. So there are three classifications. There's properties, there's businesses that we're concerned about, and then there's individuals. But when you get on to the businesses, they're all based on the properties. So you go back to the properties first because it's the most static data. You want to get the data perfect. When the data is perfect, the dollars will take care of themselves and nobody will fall through the cracks. Ross Township has 14,505 properties. Westview has 3,049. So in Ross Township, you have 13, according to Allegheny County at the register, you have 13 medical clinics, and in Westview, you have 12 one- and two-story office buildings. Are we getting all that information? So the first thing you want to do is go through everything that you believe to be a business, make, find out if it's, if it's already on the existing roles, and then you go about what you do to bring them current. Uh, depending on how good the records are, uh, we can get these things up and loaded in a period of like 24 hours, and then we just start working together and find out who did we miss. And where do you miss businesses? Well, I've looked at Giant Eagles that I found six businesses within one Giant Eagle. The deli, the food, you know, the pharmacy. Uh, they're everywhere. People that might lease strip malls. You know, you have, you look at four family units, three family units. There is a lot that can be done. I know that their records are better than what he may have, have said. You know, it's not, it's not certainly not primitive because it's very well canvassed. And there's over 300 businesses they have on the records in Westview and over 2,075 uh, in Ross Township. So what we want to do first is dollars. Turnkey is cloud software. We go through, we look at all the counts first before the dollars. Everyone measures dollars. They'll say we're up 10% for the year, we're down 5%. Well, what's that based on? Does that include delinquent? So we're going to look at counts. And if Westview has 300 businesses, if it ever goes down by one, we're going to know. But in the cloud software, we have the local address, we have the parent address, we have space for 
uh, all the contacts, all the touches, uh, every email that comes in now, a phone call, people walking indoors, everybody is using the same cloud software, highly secure, you know, it's, it's whoever you folks would give access to use it, but when everybody communicates and is on the same page, nothing will fall through the cracks. So that's the process. So there's the data, and then there's the process, and then, then there's the communication. Um, even though I was a programmer, I always, you know, I would work with operations, and I'm, I always ask questions. Can we make it better? And one of the things we have done with all the communities, uh, a couple things, we put all the businesses up on the website. Why? Well, it's self-policing. We have people come up and say, hey, my business isn't up on the web. Well, we didn't know about you, but from now on you will be. We have communications, and I highly recommend that every municipality in the state put a communications packet up there for new businesses and new residents. When you move into the town, they're going to go to the website with all they need to do. Who are the good contact numbers? So we'll focus first on getting the data scrubbed, get it clean, see who else we're missing, and make sure that they're current from you know this point on. And from there, there's all kinds of opportunities, but that's, uh, you know, that's where we start. Questions? It's taxes, I know it's. Well, I mean, I, I guess I just, this is more of a clarification than a question, that, that this is not a new tax. We are just trying to improve the collection of an existing tax that Absolutely. we already have. Yeah. yeah. So it's the business privilege in Mercantile to begin with. Right. Gross receipts based on the business. Uh, the business privilege is a service type, think doctors or accountants or, and, you know, the mercantile is things that you can walk out of a store with, with a bag, you know, of goods mm -hmm. and services. So. And how much uh, extra revenue potentially do you think we could be collecting? If I've worked with a community for a year, the worst I've done is a 26% increase, and the best I've done is a 560% increase year over year. Um, do you have any comparables of uh, other towns or, or townships that you've worked with, the, the size of Ross and Westview, to kind of give us an idea? Probably, well, Johnstown's about the same size. Uh, I went in there, they had uh, revenues and receipts of 300000 like 320000 and that was pretty consistent in the prior years. And um, the, the year after I took over, now we had a couple of, uh, pretty b substantial fines, but I found them $1.8 million. I would think with the, the records and the, the work that uh, Jerry and David had done, we'd be looking more at the 25%, but you never know if we've missed something big. But again, it all comes down to communication. We want to establish the counts. We know the counts, what they are right now. You know, the 300 businesses in 2075. We want to get the data right. Uh, and what we want to do, too, is once we find additional businesses, get them to the right people to make sure that they're not being duplicated, that they're not running as DBAs or under another name or, or whatever, and that they are legitimate and not manufacturing or 5013Cs. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Excuse me. Once you find a business, how far do you go back? if they've been in operation for five, ten years? It, it's different with any municipality. Um, the standard is usually three to five years. Um, you know, even though technically uh, if they've never paid and they knew about it, there is no statute of limitations, but that's usually the threshold that we begin working on. Um, I know that some of the folks that I've worked with, they, they want to go back 10, 20 years. I just, you know... It's, it's really, that decision is, is up to you folks. That's, you know, you want to do what's fair, but on the other hand, there, you know, there's people that have been paying all along as well, so. Well, the revenue comes in from the taxpayer, so however it's distributed right now, it would be distributed that same that same way. So it's a split between the school districts and the municipalities. So this would, I'm sorry, one moment, Mr. Schaefer. This would need to be authorized then separately also by Ross Township and, and Westview Borough in addition to the Board of Education. I guess I'm looking at Mr. Muth. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have a question, Mr. Schaefer?
we did explore a number of situations. And I don't know, did you highlight any specific examples that you gave like along the Knight Corridor? I know in the past you talked about a lot of the properties are owned by, for example, a, a REIT bank. Mm -hmm. So there could be a business in there that's paying um, rent. And, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just going off of memory of what you told us. To, to one of those entities, and they could be based in Florida, but they don't know they're supposed to be paying business privilege on the rent. Well, you brought up a couple good points. So first, there's most of the people that we do identify have no knowledge of it. They just didn't even know it existed. Um, but when you have a, a business that's paying, you know, first of all, they're bringing in revenue for you know, products or services, but they could be paying rent, and then whoever's leasing at Strip Mall, they would also be subject to the business privilege tax as well. And that's, we would be able, that's part of our data mining that we're going back to county records and see who owns the property to make sure that they're all in the tax rolls. Yes, Mr. Shaker. So another thing, did you, one thing we talked about was because there's probably a lot of potentially even home-based businesses mm -hmm. that could be, that are not in compliance with this, that could be hit with this. Mm -hmm. We talked about maybe having a threshold level so that you don't necessarily go after someone for $40 or $20. Yeah. $20. Is that an option to have like a... And that's, that's really up to you. I mean, it's whatever you have normally done, technically a lemonade stand is a business or somebody, I had, I had a gentleman that was cutting hair uh, and you know he, he called and wanted to know if he had to pay. And I said, well, what's your, you know, what, what do you bring in revenue wise? And he says, I cut it home, I bring in $600 a year. And it's like, you know what, we can't do that. It's, Just, it's a mill. So you're only paying $100 on $100,000. So if somebody's making, you know, it, again, it, you may say like what we did up in Jeanette, if it's under $20 for the year tax, it's, you know, let, let's just focus on what we need to focus on. It's, these are your businesses, so it's really, that would be part of the upfront discussion. Does anybody else have a question? Sure, Mr. Ferry, go ahead. Um, so you said you've seen in your experience 26% That's in revenue dollars. Okay, so does that revenue include the, the back years which you collected, or is that something you would expect to see going forward? That's the back years. And then, uh, you know, what normally happens, it's a it's a transitional thing. So you'll have a, a spike of what you, you know, collect delinquent-wise in the first year or two. And then what I'm doing, you know, as, that, as the project matures, you move in other areas like landlord-tenant, you know, business registration, landlord, you know, new individuals move into towns. So there's always different areas where you can find new money. Do we have any other questions? Yes, Mr. DeMarco. I, I, I have no comment, I guess, than anything else, because we, we as Commissioner Schaefer had stated, we have <coughs> discussed this with you in the past several times. Yeah. Um, being, I've been on the board for 20 years, um, and I've seen a lot of changes. Uh, one of the, a couple of the big changes, and one in particular that, that, that's happened over the years, um, in terms of our services in, in Broad Township, is our emergency services. Mm -hmm. And in particular, uh, the police, or the uh, fire departments, and our EMS. Um, we're going to have to make some, some big decisions in my opinion, over the next five or six years when it comes to those services. Okay. Um, you know, we're not in, from a budgetary st standpoint, we're, we're in pretty good shape in Ross Township. But there's some uncertainties coming down the pipe uh, when it comes to those services, especially our volunteer fire departments. And I think a lot of people have, have read about it statewide. Uh, it's, it's in crisis mode, um, and it's concerning uh, and it should be concerning, it's concerning to me, and it should be concerning to everyone. Um, so this to me is, you know, is we need, to, we need to do this. We need to do this, we need to get this done. Um, we need to soften, you know, whatever blows are gonna be coming down the pipe when it comes to services like that. Um, because there's no doubt in my mind, um, 
we're going to have to come up with more money. And I made it clear that we're going to have to come up with a plan. And I, I likened it to, I, I compared it to uh, what I was heavily involved in and still involved in over the past 15 years. And that is a condition of uh, originally our sanitary sewer systems. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon your sanitary sewer bill is going to be your, one of your single most uh, uh, expensive, uh, if not your most expensive utility bill. And that's because of, again, we, we have to pay, we have to, we have to fix these systems, or we have to, we have to provide you know, the sewer line. Um, likewise, again, we, we, we have to make sure that we're providing these services. So this, to me, um, it, it, it's a no-brainer. We, we need to do it. And we need to get moving on this, you know, um, you know to, to, to have the increased sap on the back of taxpayers because other taxpayers are not paying their fair share. It's just not fair. It's just not fair. And so. that's a good point, but you know, you brought up the AMS, so there's another database. I mean, you know, if you could use this or whatever down the road, it's it's a shared thing. But when you're looking at, you know, even an individual property, and I'm comparing records, you know, I'll compare like sewage records with the county, and the county will say it's a single family home. And I'll be talking to the building inspector and say, I saw three meters there. And then I go through the sewer bills and there's there's four bills, you know, so is it one, is it three, or is it four? So that's part of the evolution of this. We need to get the data correct, and that's where you start with the properties and then you layer the businesses on top of it. Mm -hmm. And then let me tell you where we're heading with some of my cities that are now in the, you know, the fourth, fifth, and sixth year. We're moving into the earned income tax. And I don't want to get too far off here, but Act 32 said we're going to take, there was 568 earned income tax collectors across the state. And the DCD said we're going to take them and put one per county. Allegheny County is split into four areas. So on January 1st, 2012, uh, everybody went to the county level. Well, everyone said, uh, this is great. It's all going to be, you know, everyone's going to be talking to each other. No, it's not the case. They put the onus of accuracy on the national employers. So get what? This is 2020. If you have somebody that's moving from Topeka, Kansas to Westview, and the next day they're starting at Starbucks and Green Tree, that means that some, you know, HR person out in Seattle has to say, hey, you know, on their job app it had Pittsburgh PA. I wonder if that PSD code should be Westview. <laughs> no one's looking at that. Yeah. Nobody. Because they wouldn't know. And then think of the next example. It's direct deposit. You used to get your paychecks mailed to you or somebody handed it to you. If you don't get your check in the mail, you're updating the address back in Seattle, Washington. Now, people are moving around. We've missed it. Everyone, you know, it's direct deposit. It's one to PNC from, from maybe three moves ago. So there's all these revenue streams, and you're right, but I know that every municipality on average is losing 12 to 18% across the board. <laughs> This is where it starts, but you move into the licensing, and how well is your code enforcement building inspection? You know, what's that process to get that information to the people that are tracking it? You know, it's got to be perfect. But these are easy things to fix. If it's broken, fix it. If it's a broken process, then you fix the process. But we'll, f we'll find your money. Thank, thank you, Mr. Schuster. Do we have any other questions from the board? Um, I just a procedural question. I, I believe our motion is to explore engaging the services. How would that in work with um, working with the townships and um, you know, figuring out what the threshold are is and that, that sort of thing that we talked about? Is that, yeah, yeah. Is that, yeah. I'd like to ask Mr. Muth to speak <laughs> on that, please. No, I think I think it depends on the township and the borough as far as how far they want us to go as far as enforcement, if they want to do it at all. How many years do you want to go, sure. pursue, et cetera? Um, I mean, would I, the district be in the position to make those decisions, or, or would we meet with the township and uh, Westview Borough to come to an agreement? I think independently we would meet with each of, each of those bodies independently and come to a an agreement as to whether or not they want to pursue that or not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We're just we're pretty sure so right now we the Ross I can't speak for Ross Township has designated the school district as our tax collector for these taxes. So we make the decision for you, okay. you're saying? I'm not I'm not we're sure. Always, right, I get you, but yeah. Effectively, yeah, how you collect the tax, yeah. we get right. half of it. Okay. 
Yeah. Right, and right. then you so, pay us 3%. Yeah. yeah. So what if we do is what, okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Cool. Any other questions? If not, I will run through the rest of the finance items. Um, Dr. Nolish is, is not here today, so I will be doing this in her absence. Uh, the first is a request that the Board of Directors authorize the administration administration to engage in contractual discussions with turnkey taxes incorporated for services they would provide to evaluate the completeness of the existing registered mercantile and business privilege taxpayer database and pursue the collection of delinquent taxes it so identifies services potentially would be undertaken within Ross Township and Westview Borough only if their respective governing bodies authorize turnkey, turnkey taxes to pursue collections in their respective jurisdictions uh, the next uh, is paying some bills. So we have a request for the board to ratify the general fund bills per the attached, the capital fund bills per the attached, the food service fund bills per the attached, a uh, request for the board to approve the attached budget transfers, a request that the board approve payroll for the month of January 2020 in the amount of $3,048,571.57. A request for the board to approve the appointment of a deputy tax collector for Ross Township and North Hills School District with respect to the properties in Ross Township as required by Act 164 of 2014. Um, and uh, Ross Township would like to appoint Jordan Tax Service as deputy tax collector. And last, we have a request for the board to award the bid for copy paper to W.B. Mason at their low bid of $19,924.80. I move that finance items two through nine be added to the legislative meeting agenda. Second, Second. that motion. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, and next up, I will hand it over to Mr. Little for Community and Intergovernmental Relations. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, first, we're going to have a presentation on One Tree Per Child Pittsburgh with Ms. Eloise Peet, uh, the Director of Ross Township Parks and Recreation, and Dr. <coughs> uh, Angelelli, did I get it right? Thank you. Uh, of One Tree Per Child Pittsburgh, the co-founder and ambassador. If you don't mind, I'm sorry to interrupt, would you mind speaking into the microphone just so we're able to, to capture it for our, yeah. our video? So Thank I'm, you. I'm here to share with you some stories about One Tree Per Child Pittsburgh and some great information about the work that we're doing. Uh, the story began some years ago when I went on a trip to the Eastern Plains of Colombia. Literally, we landed in the middle of nowhere. It was very scary to land uh, on that grass runway, but it ended up being a really great landing. And I went there to visit this community called Las Gaviotas where Paolo Lugari and his team have planted more than 20 million trees. These uh, Caribbean pine trees have allowed a biodiverse forest to resurface and they tap the pine trees to obtain a resin that in turn is uh, used to obtain biofuel to run the entire operations of Las Gaviotas. So they are zero emissions and they literally plant energy. I went there looking for answers and I found true inspiration and when I came back to Pittsburgh, I began to reflect on the connections between trees and how my work as a pediatrician could be connected to that. So I began to discover these incredible connections between trees, health, and environment. And that's how I learned, for example, that people that live in areas where there are more trees have less heart attacks, they have less diabetes, less obesity, less preterm deliveries, better respiratory health, better mental health. I also learned that kids that go to schools where there are more trees learn better and perform better in their tests. So working as a pediatrician in the emergency room in Pittsburgh and seeing kids with asthma every day made me reflect on our health issues with air quality and made me think that we, and realize that we're really not making as healthcare providers, we're not really working on getting to the root of the problem. And global change can actually start locally by improving the health and the respiratory health, and in general, the health and lives of our citizens. 
And uh, that's how in 2017 I was given the opportunity to open the Pittsburgh chapter of the Australian program One Tree Per Child. This program was founded by John Dee and Olivia Newton-John. And we brought the program to Pittsburgh. We have planted more than 700 trees with more than 1,000 students. And that's thanks to our partnership with Tree Pittsburgh. And some of those tree plantings have been at the Ross Element with the Ross Elementary School at Sangri Parks and with the amazing support of Eloise and Ross Township Parks and Recreation and the Ross Elementary School. It has been really been an amazing journey to work with them. And so you can see some pictures, tree plantings are just amazing, joyful days where all kids get to engage and leave a legacy. You hear the conversations that these kids are having and it's truly moving. Then um, something amazing happened this December. I suddenly got a text from Trey Pittsburgh, and I, when I read it, it said, your dreams are coming true. And I was like, what's going on? So I later learned that a local family foundation had asked them if they had any programs that were ready to be supported. And here we are, One Tree Per Child became a program of Trey Pittsburgh. And now we have our own program coordinator, Clara. Can you stand up? So Clara is our program coordinator, and she's ready to start planting trees uh, left and right. So we are very excited. <laughs> and I'm going to let Eloise share a little bit of uh, the work that we have done. Thank you. I'm really here to just say thank you, thank you, thank you. The school district, uh, Mr. Beal, it's amazing. The fifth grade, I believe, perhaps President Mavis uh, was <laughs> part of that. Um, also, our it, tree yeah. planting at Evergreen Park, we planted a hundred trees. No, Sangri. Or Sangri, I'm sorry. Um, the kids had an absolute ball. So um, I know that Mr. Beal was really instrumental in that. I was contacted um, actually later in the process and of course I said absolutely we the more we can partnership for the kids with the school district uh, the township tree Pittsburgh actually I do have to say our state DCNR the Department of uh, Natural Resources and Conservation was involved um, are we forgetting anybody I don't think so but anyway all these great agencies coming together um, I just want to share with you and I am going to have to step away from this. <coughs> this is the area, element, Ross Elementary Schools rehabilitated this whole woodland area. There, it had gotten blighted by the uh, emerald ash borer, so it was completely decimated. I mean, if you went down there, it was kind of heartbreaking. Now we have a hundred beautiful, nice, healthy trees that are planted in here. Um, some of the things that we're planning Park will be great, great, great projects for the students. We're actually hoping to plant more trees at Evergreen Park, but also trees, we're, we're putting in a rainforest, uh, a rain garden, I'm sorry, I don't know if you can see it in the upper section. Um, and these areas here, which should be really exciting for the educators and the community. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm in charge here, nobody ever. So this, areas but we want the science teachers or any teachers for that matter to be able to kind of bring students down into the stream area mm -hmm. so we'll be doing a lot of restoration here um, in this area and rain gardens here here and over here so I just get I'm very excited about this because kids get to reconnect with nature which is of course our mission um, and we get to do this kind of together with all these agencies. So thank you. I hope we can continue the support. Do you want to say anything about this? No, go ahead. Oh, well, that's really what we want kids to do. <laughs> <laughs>
And, and then this was just uh, another beautiful story that illustrates what happens during tree plantings. This was a tree planting at Classical Academy in Pittsburgh in the city. So we're on a hill, you can look at the city and kids are running around, they're picking up their trees, they're talking about them. And all of a sudden I'm planting trees with this little beautiful seven year old girl and she stops and she turns around, she looks at the city and she lifts her head and she says, I'm starting to feel proud. Not only is this fun, but we're helping. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep dreaming about this day. And I've heard that and when, with in, at many tree plant things, and when I heard that from that little girl in that setting, I was just you know, full of joy. I was so moved because this is our next generation. These kids are gonna grow up to become our leaders. So I want to invite all of you to join us and help us grow our future. And I'm, I'm gonna go through this slide really quickly because these are the most common questions about our program. So who uh, really the schools decide with absolute freedom? What are the kids that they want to participate? Sometimes we have schools that want the entire elementary school to participate. We do that. Sometimes they just want a class or the environmental club. Whatever works for the school. When? We plant during spring and fall. And the schools decide the dates and the times of the day when that works for them. So we really work to make this easy for the schools. Where? We plant on school property when they have green space. We plant on, at local parks, like it has been the case with the Russell Elementary students and at Sangri and Evergreen Park. And when there are, there's private land or anyone in the community that wants us to find us, wants to find us a space, like churches, for example, sometimes they have a lot of land. So anywhere where you want to plant trees, we can go and make it happen. And then funding is obviously one of the, uh, a really important question. So we have many funding mechanisms. We personally, uh, with the Tripets for team, we look for funding opportunities. We're constantly applying for grants. And we also rely on the support of the schools, the PTAs, the students, the parents to do fundraising events and support our cause. So for example, the Russell Mentor PTA is going to support our next tree planting and we're just super excited. And Ross uh, Township Parks and Recreation is gonna match the funds. And we bring the trip is for educator and that's with a grant that we have so we don't charge for that. This is a big team effort. Yeah. So everyone is invited and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. Can I just make a quick comment on that? I, I just wanna say I did chaperone the tree planting field trip at Ross and it was, uh, by far the most memorable field trip I've ever chaperoned, probably one of the most difficult field trips I've ever chaperoned because it's not that easy to plant a tree, but I really appreciate Mr. Beal's um, support of you know that uh, Ross Elementary's participation. And I know that the kids were just so excited to be um, doing something that you know would have a lasting positive impact in, in the community and in, in the parks that they go to. So it really meant a lot to them. And, my daughter still goes back to try to visit the tree that she planted. So, yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's true. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. I, I have some questions. Um, so, what age is appropriate for kids to start doing this? Any age. Kindergartners could go plant trees. Kindergartners can plant trees. Yeah. And Eloise, how much, I mean, do we have enough space in Ross Township that we could really take this on and run with it? And oh, absolutely. We have space we, for every yeah. kid to plant a tree? Uh, we have 22 parks, so not all of them are big as Sangree or Evergreen, but Evergreen Park is um, 38 acres, and it's not as decimated, but some of our parks have really been hit by different blights, but um, we do have reforestation Um, do you ever do you ever plant trees that are fruit trees, especially yes. on school property? Do you plant yes. orchards? Um, we can plant um, orchards. We have planted orchards with several schools. Uh, we work also with the Fruit Tree Planting Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, they have been amazing too. So we can plant either native trees, fruit trees, or we can plant uh, orchards from prepared grasses. 
I really, I just, this is incredible. Thank you so much for everything you Thank do. You. Perfect. And if, I don't know if they, <coughs> anyone wants to reach out to us or contact us, what would be the best way? Or is uh, the road website. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you all have information from me, from Eloise, yeah. from <coughs> each of y'all, or you can email Clara at clara at pittsburgh.org. Really easy. Thank you. Thank you so all much. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the next order on, under community and governmental relations is resolution 2020-01, uh, charter school funding reform. So tonight uh, we're asking is the board approve resolution 2020-01 calling for charter school funding reform. So a little bit about the information dealing with this is that Pennsylvania school districts spend millions of dollars in taxpayer money annually mandatory payments to brick and mortar and cyber charter schools. Uh, these payments are calculated in a manner which requires districts to send more money to charter schools than is needed to operate their programs and places in significant financial burden on the districts and resources of taxpayers. Uh, some other information dealing with this is uh, the current funding formula was established in 1997 and it hasn't changed in 23 years. So think about that. Y2K wasn't even a thing when this funding formula was established. <laughs> uh, the funding formula is unfair because it's based on the home district's expenditures, not what it actually costs to educate the child in a charter school. And what I found so interesting about that, so how unfair is it, is that the only year, uh, according to the Pennsylvania Department of Education, that charter and cyber charter schools ever disclosed their finances was uh, in 2014 and 2015. Across the Commonwealth, Pennsylvania schools paid $294.8 million in special ed funding to Pennsylvania charter schools. However, charter schools only spent $193.1 million on the student. That means $101.7 million overpayment to these charter schools, leaving districts across this Commonwealth. So just to give you a little understanding of what we're talking about here, uh, the tuition rate calculated based on the school district expenses creates wide discrepancies in the amount of tuition paid by different districts for the same school education. Mm -hmm. So hitting closer to home, what does this look like at North Hills, right? So uh, we took a look from 2015 to 2019. Between brick and mortar charter schools and cyber charter schools, the North Hills School District paid out $5.1 million dollars. It's $5.1 million that left this district. $5.1 million that we could have reinvested in our children just left. We're talking about something that hasn't been changed since 1997. I was in seventh grade. We need to challenge our legislators, have the courage to do the right thing. And that's exactly what this is. I'm proud of this, and I'm proud that we take a stand and fight for not only our kids, but kids across the Commonwealth, because this affects every single district. Yeah. So, any questions? <laughs> sure, I'll go ahead and make a motion that we accept Resolution 2020-01. I'll second it. Okay, any discussion? I'll just say I think it's, it's very important that we're signing this, you know, the um, the PSBA, who we talk about frequently, has, has made a call for districts uh, across the Commonwealth to adopt this. So, you know, I'm, I'm pr proud of our board for taking this on. Absolutely. Our, um, our state senator, um, Lindsey Williams, is a big proponent of um, this charter school reform as well, which is awesome. But um, she would still, I'm sure, appreciate hearing from constituents in support of this as well. So if, if 
um, you have strong feelings about this as, as we do, um, I would recommend contacting her. Yeah, I, I just want to mention, just to reiterate what mm -hmm. you said, is that uh, contact your state legislators. Mm -hmm. They are accountable to us. And you don't just have to contact your state legislators. You can contact any state <laughs> legislator and let them know how you feel. So for example, right now as we speak, there's a bill sitting in the House Education Committee called HB 1897. What that would do is make school districts have their own cyber program, keeping the dollars here then within the district. If that became law, we would have saved just this year $667,000. I'll say that again, yeah. <laughs> $667,000. The reason I say this is because, Dr. Manorino, when I, when I was sitting there with the second cup of coffee, we were talking about possibilities, right? You know, parents were talking about them. And, and we couldn't, you couldn't agree more, right? But the fact of the matter is, where are we going to pay for this, right? Because if this was money wasn't an issue, I'd drive a Tesla, but I can't because I can't afford it. But if this right. money stays within the district, there's more opportunities for those things that we want to do for our kids. It's 1897, right? Is that Correct, yes. Because I, I, I get the bill numbers mixed up. That's not the important part of this conversation. But this is something that we have been um, really screaming about for about 10 years, that we have an online academy that's strong, so we provide a cyber option for our students. But yet, if a family takes the cyber option at a district outside of ours, we pay $13,000 per student. They have that option here. We've given them that choice. That's the frustrating part. That's what 1897 is moving towards, is moving towards all districts must provide a cyber option. Well, great, because we've been doing it for over a decade. And as I met with the legislator who presented this bill in, in Meadville one morning, I told him I would have this application done by noon. We have this. We are here. We had the forethought of this a long, long time ago. We provide this opportunity for our kids, but yet we still pay that bill. And that's the frustrating part because I can tell you that our cyber program will outperform the ones that our students are enrolled in to the tune of $700,000 like Mr. Little just said. That's the frustrating part. We offer the option. We offer the service. We still pay the bill for a substandard education. Our teachers teach in that online academy here. I'll put our teachers in the classroom against anybody else's any day, whether it's face-to-face, -face, brick and mortar, or online. You'll walk out of that online academy with a North Hills diploma that means something and has stood the test of time. I continue to pay, we, I'm sorry, continue to pay a huge bill for a service that we provide better. So let's just hope that we can get some traction with a bill like 1897 and get some realistic things happening with cyber school out there because this came about as a new initiative, that this was something that was new and innovative. What's so new and innovative about this in the year 2020? It's not new and it's not innovative, but we still pay the bill, a big bill, and this is going to be a difficult budget year, and I know I've already talked to the board about that. We are a growing district. We're adding staff. We're moving sixth grade to the middle school, which is going to require additional support services for that group of students. This budget is not going to be easy. It would be a hell of a lot easier if we had an extra $700,000 to spend on our students for their needs. And I just want to say, you know, this isn't about taking away school choice. If your choice is to send your child to one of those schools, that's fine. But it shouldn't come at the cost of other children in districts across this Commonwealth. Okay, so we have a motion on the table if there's no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Little. Moving on to education, I have one item this evening. I'm pretty excited about this one. Um, this is a request for the board to accept the donations of a bookworm vending machine and flexible seating. The bookworm vending machine would be purchased by the Westview PTA and placed in the main hallway at Westview Elementary School as an incentive for reading and positive behavior. Books of varying levels and interest will be selected by the school librarian and purchased by the PTA to fill the machine as needed. And students would use tokens, not money, um, to uh, purchase, purchase these books, which they would get as a reward. I, I just think that's like such a fabulous idea. Um, and the Westview PTA also purchased wobble seats to be used as flexible seating options at small group tables and work areas in several classrooms. 
So I would like to move that item one under education be added to the legislative meeting agenda. Second. Any discussion? Will the PTA be accepting book donations? Okay. <laughs> I'd just like to say thank you. This, this is incredible. The kids are so lucky um, to have you all doing this. And I'll just take a second, you know, alternative flexible seating is kind of a new, newish concept. So for anybody who doesn't really know what it is, um, you know, we're starting to see it in districts, especially in elementary schools um, across the country where, you know, it can be as easy as buying a um, bean bag and putting it in, in a classroom to buying these, these wobble stools that actually, you know, move, they wobble, right? Um, but it's so important for so many reasons, you know, and I, I wrote down three main points I wanted to share with you guys about this, about why they're so important and why I'm so excited that, that the Westview kids are going to get this, is that, you know, just the idea of these active, this active seating is going to get the kids moving more during the school day in the classroom, um, you know, especially we see it in their core strength, it gets gets better. Uh, you know, it also, research has shown that kids who are active while they're learning, they actually ha show greater attention, they have faster cognitive processing speed, and perform better than kids who are less active because the activity stimulates your blood vessels in your brain. Um, and so, the, so moving while you're learning actually helps you learn better. It's not a distraction like some people might think that it is. Um, and then the third point is really just providing any sort of alternative seating. So even if it's not something that's getting you moving, is just another form of equity in the classroom. You know, we're, we're providing uh, seating for kids who need to learn differently. Not everybody learns the same way, sitting with their feet on the ground at a desk. Um, I never did. I always liked to lay on my bed when I was studying. Um, and so these are, these are opportunities to give kids what each, to give each child what he or she needs to learn the best way for that child. Um, and I know we're really starting to see this uh, pop up in more of our classrooms across the district and I couldn't be more excited. I think it's wonderful. So thank you. Uh, okay, with that being said, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> Motion carries, thank you. Uh, awesome. Mrs. Poniatowski, I will hand it over to you for athletics and activities. Next we have Mr. Weber who is gonna provide us with an update on athletics and activities. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Katie had said, uh, my name is Patrick Weber. I'm the athletic director. So I'm going to do um, a review of our fall sports and then our winter sports up to date uh, because those are still going on for then one week or so or a little more, we hope, with the boys basketball team. So uh, without further ado, we'll go through. So I started and I just outlined each team here as, as going through and I did add some information to the slides um, just about our coaching staff, our head coach. Uh, so start with football. Uh, Pat Carey is our head coach. Uh, talk about the team a little bit. Uh, six wins and five losses for the season. They were second in their section, so their conference record was five and two. Uh, they qualified for the WPL playoffs, and Martorelli Stadium hosted the first round playoff game uh, for the first time since 2009. So that was a big accomplishment for, for our team. Uh, they participated in a food drive as the team uh, out at Sam's Club uh, and packaged that up for the local food bank. Uh, something that I thought was really significant was that they started a, a leadership council, and this was something that the coaches put together. Um, some of the assistants, uh, Brody Zangaro and Gary Zangaro, uh, they brought this together where it was a group of guys that met once a week and just talked about different things that they encounter as a student athlete um, and how they can better their teammates. So it was, a, it was um, pretty laid back, more in a social setting at a dinner and, and things like that. But they, they held some meetings throughout, and I know Coach Carey in his end of year meeting wanted to continue that and try to build that up with, with more members as they went on. Uh, the future looked promising. Uh, the JV record was 14 and one. So uh, we're hoping for big things as, as, as they go on. Uh, I listed individual accomplishments. I'm not gonna read those all to you. Um, our first, uh, the first two names, Ronnie Nova Sedliak and Damon Thompson, they were first team all conference uh, respectively. Uh, Ronnie as an offensive tackle 
and Damon as a defensive end. Um, Ronnie has committed to Central Michigan University. He's going to play Division I football next fall, and he's already signed his letter of intent. And the only one up there, actually, that I know of that's going on to play football as of right now, Tim Sudo did make a decision, and he's going to Fairmont State University in West Virginia. So uh, Damon, I believe, has aspirations, but he hasn't made a college choice yet. Uh, moving on to boys soccer, uh, Jared Staggerwald is our head coach. Uh, talk about the team there. Six wins, ten losses, two ties. Uh, they're sixth in their section at four, eight, and two. Uh, something I thought that was interesting for them, uh, in 18 games, uh, they they only gave up 33 goals. Uh, so that was only 1.83 uh, goals per game, which is which is pretty good. Uh, the, really, with the competition in the section that they're in with North Allegheny, Seneca Valley, um, Pine Richland, the, the, the competition is tough. This year was 50 years of North Hill soccer program, and they honored that team at their annual soccer fest. Uh, and they had a dramatic win that night against Deer Lakes, and the last couple seconds uh, they they got it done. So uh, two individual accomplishments for them, Marlone and Duncan Kreps were all section honorable mention for them. Uh, girls soccer led by Rochelle Dixon, 3-12-1. Uh, uh, they were six in their section at one and eleven. Again, in that tough section uh, with the with the four A teams in our area uh, that have have been pretty successful. Uh, one thing I did bring up the note that they had a uh, breast cancer awareness game and they collected donations and they ended up donating one hundred and fifty dollars to the Glimmer of Hope Foundation through that evening. Uh, so that was something that they gave back to um, that charity. Individual accomplishments, Alexa Smolinski and Olivia Yoder were both honorable mention. Elena Longjohn, uh, probably our best player. Uh, she actually got injured in preseason and was out for the whole entire year. But she is actually going to William & Mary on a uh, full scholarship to play soccer. And they honored that. So she's already signed her letter of intent as well. So uh, we wish her the best of luck. Boys and girls cross country, um, again, they were a, a really young team uh, with a new head coach, Shannon Metzler. Uh, as you could see, the girls uh, had a couple wins there, two and five, and the boys didn't end up getting one for the, for the year. But they have 13 letter winners that come back. And I know Coach was excited that a lot of the time drops came down um, from the beginning of the season, so they saw a lot of improvement. Girls volleyball led by Vicki Danko. Um, Really, I think girls volleyball turned around a uh, successful season at nine and nine. Um, they're three and eight in their section, but uh, they that doesn't really do them justice. They were only about one game, one match out of it for the playoffs. Uh, they won the Greensburg Salem tournament. Uh, the individual recognition there, Sydney Ryan, she's a junior, will return next year. She was second team all section. Um, Kayla and Megan were honorable mention. And Coach Danko actually voted on by the coaches. Uh, received coach of the year in section one and four a so I think that her efforts didn't go unnoticed within the coaches uh, that she went against all year um, so look at looking bright for them girls tennis uh, coach McTy um, they are three and 14 overall um, Emma Kim and Megan Schill participated in the singles tournament and then Emma, Emma and Megan made up a doubles team as well as Emma Humphrey and Rachel Byrne. They went to the doubles tournament and represented us. Um, Emma did make it past the first round, but then uh, she lost in the second round in the singles tournament to a girl from Mars. Um, and I know, remember Coach McTy telling me um, that they, the one match for Megan was almost you know, two hours because she was battling a girl from Seneca Valley. So, um, that takes a lot. It takes a lot. I don't know. I don't know how it ended up on the wrong end for us, but uh, it was a great accomplishment to be in it. Uh, the golf team led by Coach DeWeese. Uh, they they were overall uh, zero and twelve. Um, you know, they struggled, but you know, we struggled with participation this year a little bit. So we're trying to do a little some other things to get kids interested. Um, I think some 
some of the golf courses around that the kids are, are, are not that accessible. So we do golf at Shanapin for varsity and we do golf at Clover Hill for the JV matches. So trying to get more kids out to Clover Hill and get them involved in the summer. I know as Coach DeWeese is uh, one of his aspirations to get more kids involved. Um, losing three seniors, uh, trying to get more kids to come out from the middle school. Uh, we're all in his plans. Uh, Tyler Manfred, Logan Marshalik, and Hannah Shuley uh, represented us in the individual tournaments. And actually, Hannah, I think, has some – she's a junior, so she comes back, and I think she'll lead the charge um, for us. And she has some interest in college golf, and she had a couple low scores that we were intrigued by. So that wraps up the fall. Move into the winter here. So boys basketball, uh, head coach is, is Buzz Gabus. Currently, they sit at eight and twelve, and three and six. And I know you're probably saying, "Well, how are they going to make the playoffs?" But um, Friday night, they played North Allegheny here. It's uh, their senior night, and the winner gets in, and the loser goes home. So it's the old North Hills North Allegheny rivalry on Friday night at seven thirty. The seniors are honored at seven. Uh, we're doing a red out, trying to get as many people as we can to come and support the boys. And it actually is a girl-boy doubleheader that night, so the girls will play at 6, and then the boys will play at 7.30. Um, throughout the season or the fall or the winter, you know, fall and into the winter, they do a little dribblers program, and they have the kids perform. And that was a huge success, and it keeps the kids interested. I think we had over 100 a little in the little dribblers program, and I know a lot of you were there that night. So uh, that, that was – that was fun for them to get on the big court and, and see the crowd. Girls basketball, Coach Dudas. Coach Dudas is in his first year for us. Uh, right now they're they're six and fourteen overall, uh, section two and eleven. We've endured some injuries over the past couple of weeks, where uh, you know we're we're trying to just get. We have two games left, so I know that he's trying to put together a patchwork lineup as we go. Uh, they had a pink out game as well against Fox Chapel, and that was on January 30th. Uh, they were doing a similar donation to the Glimmer of Hope Foundation that evening. And their senior night is actually upcoming on February 10th, and that's at 7 o'clock. And the tip-off is at 7.30, and they, they finished the season that night versus Penn Trafford. A boys and girls swimming and diving. Uh, the boys, the boys have a lot less numbers than the girls, so they they're at two wins and eight losses. The girls right now are are dominating. Uh, they're nine and one, so I think a lot of recognition. <clears throat> sometimes, you know, the, it gets lost in translation. But their one loss is to Seneca Valley, and I know talking to Coach Marsack, is he. Uh, he said that that was the closest deficit that they've swam Seneca Valley in the past few years. So, and that's a pretty strong swim program. Uh, they have they have one more they have one more meet left against North Allegheny, uh, which will be a tough one. But as you can see, we have over 20 individual WPIL qualifiers for um, the end of February, with probably the possibility there to. Um, you know, move on to the state, you know, into the state. And that's the the home meet is next Tuesday at 5 here against NA. Wrestling coach Martinez. Uh, so they were 2 and 3. Looks a little odd because that's, you know, that's just their section record. You know, wrestling, they do have a few matches um, outside of the section. They finished fourth place. They actually lost the Fox Chapel 40 to 39, which would have put them in the third place match. Um, so, you know, it was a one point, one point away, but I know that we've, we did have a lot of individual accomplishments there listed. So uh, six, six guys there placed at Shar Houston tournament. Uh, at the Powerade tournament, which is really a national tournament, uh, two guys placed. And then the Allegheny County tournament, uh, we did have seven, seven wrestlers uh, make the medal stand. Uh, Sam Hillegas is one of the best wrestlers in the state, and he's right here. Uh, he's committed to Virginia Tech. As you can see, uh, he's wrestling 138 pounds. Um, he... 
the Chartier's Houston tournament, he won first place, was the MVP, had the most pins. In the Power Eight tournament, he did lose to a kid from Wyoming Seminary, uh, four two. Uh, so I think that he might have lost to him twice in his career. I think he has four career losses. And then at the Allegheny County Tournament, he was first place, making him a three-time county champion. And he won the sportsmanship award that they give out at that tournament. So uh, if you haven't seen Sam wrestle, I know sometimes it's hard. But now that we get into the WPIL and the PIAA, he'll have some more matches. Uh, it was really cool. The wrestling boosters did on their senior night of Sam Hilligus bobblehead night. <laughs> Um, they they were trying to give them out to everyone, but they found that that was a little expensive. So they did have, uh, they had, a, I think, five they gave away and gave one to Sam's parents and then the athletic department. So it was pretty cool just to see that recognition. So here I just added um, some of our athletes that signed there. So up in the top left is Ronnie Nova Sedliak. As I mentioned, he's gone to Central Michigan. Uh, Isabella Grell, she's one of our swimmers. She's going to swim at Clarion. In the middle there is Sam that I just spoke about. Um, up top is Maddie Cordial. She is uh, going to swim at Edinburgh. And then the bottom right corner is Elena Longjohn going to William & Mary and Madison Martin, who uh, is going to play volleyball at UPG, so Pitt Greensburg. Um, just a couple other things that I would I just wanted to discuss in the athletic department We do have a varsity club and I know Ms. Zimmerman is going to talk about our clubs But we do have a varsity club and again, it's a student initiated club that I meet with monthly and we talk um, about different things that are that come up in sports and We also try to come up with ideas how to make it better for the student athletic experience um, and try to promote it uh, try to come up with special events. So I, I put that there, but then I also listed a couple things that we did up to this point in the year. Uh, we did have the students participate in a concussion and a nutrition presentation. So we did a concussion presentation with a uh, former North Hills alum that w is working on that in her collegiate coursework, and she presented to them, and, and it was very valuable. We had about 40 students attend that. And then the nutrition, we worked in conjunction with uh, Ms. Radsvin. Um, she had some Pitt graduate interns, and they came in and did a presentation on what students should really eat before competition and, um, you know, what, you know, really what they should be fueling their bodies with. Uh, the plan is hopefully in the spring, I'm trying to get a couple teams. Uh, we want to do a presentation on hydration because I think that goes uh, – a lot of student athletes don't really understand, like they're, I'm just going to drink Gatorade all the time. Um, but we're going to set that up in the next couple of weeks again with that same group. The second bullet there in November, uh, I took student athletes to all of the North Hills Elementary uh, schools, and we read to all kindergarten and first grade students. Um, so I take a, take a group of about 15 student athletes, and we go to every school. And, uh, you know, whenever... Whenever they're in there, it is great to see those kids interact with, you know, our athletes in the uniform. And, you know, it's even better when you take Ronnie and he's six seven standing next to our kindergartner. Um, you know, it's great because they, you know, they're really looking up to him. Uh, and then another thing is we attended the annual WPIL Sportsmanship Summit uh, where we take four junior or six juniors, pardon me, to participate in that event with all of the schools in the WPIL at the Heinz History Center where they're going through different topics and hear from different panels of speakers of uh, really what sportsmanship means. Um, just a couple other highlights. So we did receive an uh, Allegheny Health Network donation for the new chairs in the middle school gymnasium. So if you've been to uh, the basketball games, we finally got those out, and, and that was gracious enough, and we were able to then put the sponsorship sticker in conjunction with our graphics class using them to create that. We, we, got, that, we got those out for um, all of the games. We also coordinated with our college and high school sports management or sports marketing class to conduct the $25,000 shot contest. <laughs> um, so that was really cool because they, they came to me. Um, a couple of the students who are in that work in the office, they came up and I went into their class and they just wanted to do something that was different. 
And that was like the first idea that came like, what can we do? And the first question was like, can we have the big check? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> um, so th it, was, it was really cool to just get their ideas because they've seen that stuff uh, to spark interest. So uh, unfortunately, we didn't have a winner. Mr. Laval was the one that got picked. He, he ended up, you know, he ended up, uh, he made it to the free throw, but didn't get past that. So, and then the last bullet is we're currently participating in the sportsmanship initiative where there's been a lot of um, social media posts and things throughout the district for the We Finish Together collecting medals. And I'd like to thank Ms. Kazara because I didn't, I didn't earlier, but she dropped off a bag of medals. Um, and I, no, I talked with Mr. Beal before he had left because the Kindness Club at Ross had reached out to me and they were willing to have those students work on redecorating those medals for us. So partnering with them, and he just told me that they, I guess yesterday, they have over 100 medals that they've collected there. So I have about 50 more in my office. Uh, again, we collect until the end of, end of the month week here and maybe some more at the elementaries to have and, and get those out so that that was that was pretty interesting and that's another varsity club that if i need to we'll have those students decorate them the last thing that i did want to bring up um is just our contest start times uh a lot of times or a lot of the sports that we currently have right now are a six o'clock JV start and a 7.30 varsity start time. Um, football is a 7.30 start time. So I'm, I'm proposing, I don't know just if there would be any discussion on this. Uh, I'd like maybe to move up the evening contest to start at 5.30 for JV and 7 o'clock for varsity and proposing to move the football start time to 7 o'clock. Uh, the reason being for that overall is, you know, our student athletes and the opponent student athletes they're getting home 30 minutes earlier to you know work on academics or whatever they may need to do um i think i understand some of the cons where uh, maybe it is a little bit early but with, when i look at football across our conference everyone starts at seven o'clock and you know sometimes i think about those friday nights and what time those you know what they what they start and the amount of people that are involved in something like that to make that go um, just for staffing as well to, to make that a little more productive on, on our end to find game workers. So not that I want to leave you with that, but I'm going to leave you with that before I turn it over to uh, Mrs. Zimmerman. Not that we need a vote on this, um, but Pat and I talked about this. And it's, is this something that the board would be comfortable with Pat moving to? And, and like you said, I think we are the only one in our conference that kick off at 730. And and I can tell you just from the number of WPL games that I attend based upon my position, I don't know of, I think I know of one other school that starts at 730. I guess my only question would be, have you spoken to Mr. Lavelle about this in terms of the music department and the marching mm -hmm. band? No, we can definitely talk to him and see just if there's get an his impact opinion in on that it. nature. That's, that's sure. my only question. Yeah. Other than that, I'm thinking yeah. about it. Mr. Weber, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to ask the gym availability with other sports and practice times and things like that. Has that all been worked out? Those are things. So I've had a couple coaches come to me to ask about this, uh, the possibility of moving it to this time just because they're concerned because I think they've heard feedback from their student athletes of, hey, can, would this be a possibility of what times? I don't think that would be just something that we would work through. And I think a lot of our coaches would, I'm sure there would be a little bit of adjustment period. But I don't think that we would run into, you know, run into that. And I don't, I don't necessarily mean that mm -hmm. this needs to be a blanket thing. Maybe it is a sport by sport case, um, where I'd like it to be blanket so everyone gets used to it. But you know, if we have coaches that may not be able to get there that time, you know, hopefully we can work something out. Uh, but I don't, I don't see facilities being, you know, being an issue. But I think talking with Mr. Laval. And, and, and touching base would absolutely be a – and I think a lot of the games, just like Dr. Manorino had said, all of the WPIL playoff games, they start at 7. Um, all of the PIAA <laughs> games start at 7. So really, I don't know if it would be a huge shift for Mr. Laval other than, you know, really getting it out and communicating it. Yeah. 
And there's, I mean, there's games that start like the softball and that sort of thing. They're in the afternoon too, right? So this doesn't affect all sports either, right? It's correct. Just the the yeah, the game. afternoon start times will not be correct. It, this is more of, I didn't list them all, but whenever we're thinking about fall sports, it would be soccer that we were, boys and girls soccer um, and girls volleyball. Then we would move to basketball. Would it be feasible to do 530 and 7 in the winter? And then we move to the spring where it would be lacrosse, boys and girls lacrosse. It will be boys volleyball, um, so those are the those are the sports really that would be affected. The afternoon start times wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't change. Pat, can you check on others that are doing basketball at five thirty? Yes, I will. I know sometimes that that's that's not really a shift, and that's why I went to maybe say it's a sport by sport. Yeah, um, again, I don't. I personally don't know of any. Yeah, but a lot of them are still be. six and seven thirty. Yeah. Having a daughter in middle school that played volleyball, I know sometimes her games were running late and the high school girls were coming into things. I don't know if it was game night or what it would be, but just that communication with the middle school. To yeah. Make sure not, they're not running over each other. Absolutely. Yeah, all things that we have discussed. Again, I just wanted to, I wanted to get a little discussion just because I know that everyone has a different perspective on it. My perspective is different than, you know, I don't, I, my kids aren't there yet playing sports, yeah. so. I, I don't have that perspective. So just to hear some of the feedback. And I, I realize that sometimes, you know, 530 may be tough to get to. Um, but I know a lot of schools in the area that I've talked to, you know, some of the other athletic directors, uh, they move to that start time just because, it, you know, it does a little earlier night for everyone. Okay. I'll turn it over to Shelly Zimmerman, Director of Activities. Hi everyone, I'm Shelly Zimmerman. I'm the activities coordinator, coordinator here at North Hills School District. Um, so, so far this year, we have had a lot of events that just even come out of our athletic and activities office. Um, so, so far, since the beginning of the school year, um, we have hosted the fall and winter pep rallies. Um, that's where we introduce all of our sports teams for each season, um, they all get to play a bunch of games and have a good time. And we always have them donating something as well. So we give back to the district. Um, the fall pep rally, we, you can bring food donations for our backpack initiative. And for the winter one, we collected books to donate. Um, we also have an activity fair at the beginning of the year for school. We usually do it um, the second week in school. Uh, we have all the clubs and activities set up tables in our cafeteria during all the lunches and each club promotes what they do. So all the students during all the lunches come and see what they can join. And they can sign up right there and sign their names and um, start a new club. We also host the North Hills Sports Hall of Fame. We do the dinner at Rico's restaurant every year and we induct our new members there. And then the next night we honor them with their um, families before the home varsity game on the field. So it's a nice celebration for the community and the new members that get inducted. We also do our holiday shop at in our office up at the high school in November. We open it up to have our boosters and our club members or our club <coughs> clubs come up and if they have any apparel or any spirit items that they sell during the year, they bring it up and let the public or anybody come up and purchase items for the holiday or just for whatever they want. Um, we open it up in the evening. It's usually 6 to 8. So we do get a lot of uh, people coming up to enjoy new things. Uh, we also hosted the Woody Woodburn dedication this year. Um, we renamed our middle school gym to be called the Dungeon. Uh, Woody 
was our ninth grade basketball coach for years, and he always referred to that gym as the dungeon. So it was a real honor, I think, for his family and everybody involved that um, it's something new for, for us. We also did a new pep rally this year um, for the high school. It was ninth through 12th grade. It was the day before winter break, the last period of the day. We ended up being able to get the whole school across the street to the middle school and had four teams. We had about 12 kids, which included ninth through 12th grade on each team, and they all competed against each other in some games. Um, everybody seemed to have a really good time, and the crowd, the kids in the crowds liked it and everything, so hopefully we can continue to do that next year. Um, our clubs, sorry, I forgot to start my power presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so the AFS club, they hosted in November the international dinner, which about 100 students came with all kinds of food from their different cultures, and it was a great evening for all of us who attended. Um, they sang, they danced, they actually got up and taught people to dance, like different, different dances. <laughs> but it was a really great night. They all seemed to have a good time. Um, our Airhood Club publishes about four newspapers a year, and they also have the nharrowhead.com website where you can go on anytime and catch the latest news of North Hills. Our astronomy club hosts planetarium nights three times a month. Uh, you can make a reservation and come and see our planetarium shows. Our bands, our fabulous bands, as everybody knows, um, we have elementary band, middle school band, high school bands, plus part of all the bands is our marching band. Um, our marching band, they do our pep rallies. They start their season off with a preview night for everybody who wants to go see them at Camp Conaqui at their band camp. And that's a real nice event that the kids are all excited, they worked real hard, and you get to come up and see them perform of what we're gonna see during all the games for this season. Um, they also travel to all the varsity home and away games and perform there and support the teams. They also even attend our varsity basketball games and the pep band, well, the night we had the little dribblers, we had like the whole band that night. It was awesome. <laughs> so it created a great atmosphere. Um, and they end in the fall with their stadium review concert, which is a really nice concert. The flag line performs, majorettes perform, and they do all their songs that they did throughout the season. Um, we also have the jazz band, symphonic band, orchestra, um, the winds ensemble. Um, they do PMEA events throughout the school year, and our wind ensemble, as you all know, they were invited to travel to Indianapolis next month to play music for the National Festival. So everybody's really excited about that, and it's a real honor for them. Um, also, all our bands, elementary, middle school, and our high school bands, all perform concerts throughout the entire school year. So, so far this year, they've done their fall concerts and their holiday concerts as well. Our cheerleaders, they are leaving tomorrow to compete at Walt Disney World for the UCA <laughs> National High School Championship. So we're excited for them. We hope they do well, and it's a safe and fun trip for them. 
They also this year have volunteered at the North Hills Rehab Center. Um, usually we do bingo nights there, but when the cheerleaders went, the residents actually wanted to teach, for them to teach them cheers, so they did. So that was a real fun <laughs> night for them. Our choir, we have elementary, children's choir, we have the concert choir at the middle school, and we have lots of choirs at the high school. <laughs> uh, we have our symphonic choir, women's choir, North Hill Singers, the Madrigal Dinner Choir, or Madrigal Choir, that actually hosts a Madrigal Dinner in December, and it's a fun night. Um, they serve you a spaghetti dinner, and you get to listen to them sing and do like a magical play. So it's a fun, fun, nice event. Um, they are also hosting our cabaret night, which is in a couple weeks on February 21st, up, up here at the high school in the cafeteria. If anybody wants to come, it starts at seven o'clock. Um, they, all of our choirs also travel and do PMEA festivals throughout the year and they all do concerts throughout the year as well, like the bands. Our children's choir just had their holiday concert as well as our middle school concert choir and our high school choir. Our future Teachers of America, uh, they participate in the tutoring program at the Westview Hub and they also are starting to plan their teacher teacher shadowing events. Our Hilltop Heroes Club just had our Light Side Academy event last month that raised over $900 for, our, for the Superhero Foundation, which benefits victims against child abuse. Our History Club has, for the past couple weeks, they've had a table in the lobby of the high school when everybody comes in in the morning and they're trying to get everybody to register to vote for our upcoming elections that are so important. Our drama club, our high school drama club puts on our fall play, which was Clue, which was pretty much sold out every night. So it was very well attended and it was, it was really good. Everybody enjoyed it. As we mentioned before, our middle school puts on our winter musical, which was The Little Mermaid. They just finished everything over the weekend, and they too almost sold out every night our middle school auditorium, which holds over a thousand seats. So they did a really nice job, and it was fun to watch them up there. For our spring musical this year at the high school, it's Catch Me If You Can. Uh, they've been working really hard rehearsing and getting it all together and making the sets, and that's going to be in March. So look for ticket sales. Um, that'll be coming out soon. Our environmental club has been conducting an air pollution study at the high school, and they are promoting reusable straws. So if anybody wants one, let me know. I'll get one for you. It even comes with a little cleaner that you can clean it. They're really good value. They, <laughs> like $2 for a straw. Yes, $2. Our FBLA, um, so far this year, they participated in our trunk or treat event. They attended business day at Penn State Barron. They attended the accounting career day at Duquesne University. And while they were even at Duquesne, um, they ended up seeing a bunch of FBLA former members, so they said that was a lot of fun getting to see graduates from North Hills there. Um, and they just raised in December uh, money for the American Heart Association with our big cookie sale. Um, they sell cookies during lunch because we don't have the big cookies anymore. So the two times they do that every year to raise money for charities, um, they sell out. They, uh, they raised over, 
$1,000 for the big cookie sale. They had a bake sale at our curriculum night, and now they're just getting ready for the state leadership conference. Our National Honor Society had our new member inductions this past October, and they participated in our Thanksgiving food drive in November. NHTV provides our high school morning announcements every morning at school. Our SAD club promoted Red Ribbon Week the end of October and attended a SAD conference in November at Seven Springs. Our So Fabulous Club made holiday ornaments for the North Hills Cares event that was held at the Northway Block. And they also made homemade hand warmers for our local police departments and also added some chapstick and a gift card to each little hand warmer. Our ski club, which we started last year, provides ski trips to our students, and we've been going to Seven Springs. So this year was their first trip, uh, the Friday before break, and they went to Seven Springs and had a great time. Over 40 kids ended up going. So our next trip is planned for February 28th this month, and hopefully we'll get a lot of kids to sign up for that one as well. Our science club uh, was just at the Westview Elementary Science Fair today that helped judge the science fair and can't wait to hear the winners of that. Our high school class officers, um, so far this year, they helped coordinate our senior night at our football game for our football band and cheerleaders. They organized the Thanksgiving food drive uh, that benefits our families here in the North Hills. They hosted the dinner with Santa and promoted make-a-wish letters to Santa. And currently, we're working on planning a Prince and Princess Royal Tea Party in March. <laughs> so all ages are invited to come. You can come dressed as your favorite prince or princess and hang out with all the prince and princesses that will be there that you can get your picture taken with. <laughs> Our student council and hands for service, they've, every year they just start off the year working towards THON that will be held in April. Um, so the first event they did was they hosted the Trunk or Treat event in October where a lot of our clubs and some even just community members ended up coming and decorating their trunks. And they handed out candy to all the little trick-or-treaters that came. Uh, we had face painting and we had food and games as well. And it was a fun, fun night. Uh, Dee was there. Allie ended up having her, she had her own trunk. Yeah. So that was, that was awesome. <laughs> I was a cat, yeah. <laughs> um, they also help with the student section at our football and basketball games and started the cookie race. If anybody yeah. hasn't been to one of our football games, uh, at the end of the third quarter, we do a cookie race like a pierogi race yeah. at the pirate game. It's really cute. So there's a picture up there of the kids dressed. Um, they also, at the beginning of the year, we had a spirit door contest and then during December we have a holiday door contest in the high school and they um, everybody decorates their doors of the classrooms so it's a lot of fun it brings the holiday spirit to school we they collected letters for troops overseas they celebrated mr. Rogers kindness day with writing kind notes that we put all over the school, and also everybody had to wear a cardigan sweater that day. Um, they, also, they organized the collection of the Make-A-Wish letters for writing letters to Santa, and for every letter 
that Ms. DePasquale took up the school, or up to Macy's, Macy's donated a dollar for every letter to make a wish. So she had, she had a huge stack of letters. So that was really great. Um, she hosted a volleyball tournament that funds raised from there will go towards Dawn. And they also volunteer at the North Hills Rehab Center in Wexford with bingo nights. And next, our French club. Our French club visited the nationality room at the University of Pittsburgh, followed by lunch <laughs> at Paris 66, where the owners of Paris 66 are French, so they got to use, speak in French the whole time they were there with the owners, the local owners. Um, also, the student officers coordinated a French breakfast with all the members to welcome the new school year, including croissants, quiche, fruit, and pastries. Our French Club and French Honor Society also helped at the international dinner. They helped decorate and all of their members came as well. They also do a French Honor Society through the French Club and they inducted new students this fall. They um, also the students made and donated over 12 dozen cookies to Boucher's Battalion, <laughs> I mess up. <laughs> and it's a local organization dedicated to sending care packages to the troops overseas. Also, our French Honor Society students have donated $750 to the Cali Orphanage in Haiti since 2017. Our Spanish club, they participated in the Pulsera project. It's a six day sale of fair trade bracelets and purses made by artisans in Nicaragua and Guatemala and they raised $1,240 that they sent to the Pulsera project. Um, they also attended the tour, the December nationality tour at the University of Pittsburgh. Our German club had a movie field trip and got to interview a Holocaust survivor. They did their annual Tired for Tots fundraiser in December and they raised $1,200 that will be donated to a local charity. And right now they're planning their trip to the National Holocaust Memorial Museum in May. Our middle school student council they hosted Spirit Week, where they had a um, twin day, a green day, an 80s day, and a sports day. Uh, they organized the Unity Day at the middle school. They went on and they went to the Urban Air facility. They also had their fall activity event at the beginning of the school with a dance and a bunch of activities in the gyms that the students can participate in. And they hosted the Halloween dance. Their snowball dance is next Friday for the middle school as well on Valentine's Day. The middle school service club did a kids helping kids coin war that benefited the Ronald McDonald house. They did kindness cards and posted them all over the school. They did a Thanksgiving food drive where they collected over a thousand food items and were able to send complete Thanksgiving dinners home with our North Hills, some of our North Hills families. And they also, every year they go to the Vincentia nursing home and have a holiday party with the residents. They um, Christmas carol, they play games and they give gift baskets to each resident. They make sh sure they take them for gifts for them. Our middle school world language clubs are 
Spanish, French, German, and Latin. Um, they sample culture from every language. Uh, they learn songs and dances, they make crafts, and they try food, the cultural food, and listen to authentic music. Our Highcliff Elementary, our student council hosted a food drive for the community outreach program, Food Pantry. Um, they did Teacher May I Week and raised over $1,500 that they donated to the Smile Train and the Western Pennsylvania Humane Society. They also have a great parent organization support, uh, which does book fairs, talent shows, the holiday shop, and much, much more. McIntyre Elementary, their student council also does a Make-A-Wish Spirit Week. They do um, the Super Bowl food drive that benefits the North Hills Community Outreach Program Food Pantry and their parent organization. They support a lot of activities as well, like the book fair, book bingo, family fun nights. Um, they have their own little cheer group, uh, North Hills Junior Volleyball, Chess Club, and Kids of Steel, and much, much more. Ross Elementary, they did kids, the JDRF Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation Kids Walk, and they ended up raising $1,275. They also raised $1,600 for the March of Dimes. And for Make-A-Wish, they donated $4,950 with a turkey decorating contest, a Teacher May I Week, snowman decorating contest, and a holiday outfit contest. Also, Ross's parent organization provides activities and support with back to school, the back to school social, the fun run, the book fairs, talent shows, family movie nights, bingo, book bingo, and much, much more as well. Our Westview Elementary, their student council did Rainbow for Riley event. They also collected donations for the Ronald McDonald House for Halloween. They did a food drive for the, with a kickball game to donate to Westview students. They did a dress like a snowman day and a superhero day. And Westview Parents Organization as well does the book fair, STEM assemblies, extreme sports, holiday stores, kids of steel, science fair, and more. Our North Hills club sports, we have slow pitch softball, inline roller hockey, ice hockey, and bowling. Our slow pitch softball team won their first ever championship this year. So it was really exciting for the girls and Ed. <laughs> so congratulations to them. I'm happy for them. Uh, inline roller hockey and ice hockey are continuing their season. Inline is just about done. They both had their senior nights in the past few weeks. Um, ice hockey still has a few games left. And bowling had their last match today. They were... They have their boys team and the girls team. And I didn't follow my notes, so now I have to find page <laughs> nine. They, uh, Don Albert is in first place right now, so he will be able to compete. He'll main. After today, he should have maintained his spot for him to bowl in the WPIBL Singles Championship and then a spot on the Regional Singles Championship. If he does well in those, he could make it to the state championship. Um, our, the boys team, the boys bowling team is currently in fourth place and the girls 
is currently in second. And that's about it for my <laughs> Are <you> sure <laughs> for my activities presentation. With everybody's excited for the rest of the school year and we'll have lots more to talk about in May. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much and, and thank you to Mr. Weber as well. Um, next up, I will hand it over to Mrs. Rennebeck for A.W. Beatty Career Center update. Um, for A.W. Beatty students, um, they had the students of the month that we needed to report for November and December. Uh, it was Logan Bender for Advanced Computer Programming, George Parker for Automotive Collision Technology, Austin Gary for Automotive Technology, and Cassandra Fondi for Cosmetology. And then for December and January, Taylor Solomon for automo Automotive Collision Technology, Malia Johnson for Early Childhood Education, William Fulmer for Robotics, Engineering, and Technology. And then for the Skills USA District 8 winners and competitors, for Pin Design, Mark Yoakum for Ad Design. Prepared Speech was Melissa Milner for Ad Design. Crime Scene was um, Cassia Bauer, Emergency Response Technology. An automotive service technician was Brendan Lip for automotive technology. And there are no action items to go over, so that's it for Baby Tech. Thank you so much. Mrs. Spade, personnel? Uh, personnel items are discussed in executive session. The superintendent recommends, and I so move, that the board approve personnel item one through four. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Ms. Cozera, do you have a legislative update this evening? No legislative update this okay. evening. Okay. Uh, then I will also ask you to give us a policy update. All right. Um, so the policy committee met on January 23rd, 2020. Um, as I mentioned in some previous meetings, we are sort of doing a comprehensive review of all of our policies. Um, we are combining, we're, we're looking at policies that haven't been looked at for a while to see if they need to be updated and um, to what extent they need to be updated. So we got through um, a good chunk of policies and we still have a lot more to go, but um, the ones that we reviewed and determined that no changes were needed were um, nine, indemnification and defense, 212, reporting people progress, 218, graduation ceremony participation, and um, 309, 409, and 509, which deal with assignment and transfer um, for various um, employee groups. Um, we also have determined that we can um, delete policy 119, vendors at home athletic events, because the parameters of this policy are covered under two more recently updated policies, which are 229, student fundraising, and 913, non-school organizations, groups, individuals. Um, I also have a number of policies for first reading that do have some um, relatively minor changes, I think. Um, these are mostly updated language um, to, you know, kind of comply with more recent, um, you know, laws and um, language and that sort of thing. So the policies we have for first reading are um, 10, district contract policy, 110, instructional supplies and school equipment, um, 202, attes attendance of non-resident students, 230, public performance by students, 311, job-related travel, travel expenses, 440, responsibility of staff for student welfare, 607, tuition income, and 706, property records. And I do want to mention that these are, um, there's no particular <laughs> rhyme or reason with how we're, we're just kind of, like we're trying to deal with the ones that haven't been updated, um, you know, the longest amount of time and there are you know, we're kind of just going through them. So if, if you happen to know of a policy that you know is needs to be updated, we just haven't gotten to it yet, and we will. Um, so those are the ones that um, we have for first reading. And um, I'm going to um, do the motion um, to add them to the agenda and then open it up for discussion if anybody has any. I know Ms. Philpott um, and I had talked separately. I know she has some um, points that she wanted to make about one of them. And if anybody else does, we can do that. Um, so I move that policy items two through nine be added to the legislative meeting agenda. I'll second it. Okay. Any discussion? So the one policy that just has a little change that we think possibly might, it's number 440, sorry. It's um, 
the responsibility of staff for student welfare. Um, after we went through it and added it, um, I, th I thought, you know, maybe one of the bullets under guidelines might be something we want to reconsider. Um, um, it says, do not allow students whose recognized physical, it's the third one um, up from the top, or from the bottom, sorry. It says, do not allow students whose recognized physical or mental condition makes them especially prone to accident to use dangerous equipment. Um, and I just kind of paused with that one. I don't know um, that it's something we really want to, to say as a district. Um, you know, Sandy, Sandy made a comment that it, it's a little ableist. Um, and so, I don't know, I think at looking at it, if we delete that one, um, I think that the one right underneath of it covers it. In general, exercise good judgment when assigning tasks mm -hmm. to children to prevent bodily harm and damage to property, I think, is more what we're trying to say other than we are not going to allow kids with, a, with some sort of condition to use equipment. Yeah, when we were talking about it after we put this on the agenda, I think we don't want the teachers to feel like they have to let everybody do everything if they feel <coughs> that it's unsafe for somebody to do mm -hmm. something for some reason. And I think you're right, and, and Dr. Manorino um, talked about this with us as well, and I think we're all, um, at least the three of us, were in agreement that, that, um, that I think we can still um, obtain what we're looking for with removing that bullet point and just relying on the in general. Um, bullet point. Also, oh, just so everybody knows yeah. what they're looking at. Yeah, um, sorry. Just by looking at this, mm -hmm. because it's purple underlined, shows us that we added, we just added that language to this mm -hmm. policy, mm -hmm. and it's something that can be easily removed. If this, if the board says that we feel like it is covered under the one below that, which is green, and green means that it was there in the policy, it's just moved. It's in mm -hmm. a different location now. So, th so those of you that are looking at the colored version, that's what those colors mean. Sorry. Yeah. Um, it's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I, I think that's important to yeah, know that this is. was something as we went through the audit and we were looking at other district policies and matching them with PSBA's recommendations that this is a sentence that was not in ours that mm -hmm. we found in another policy and thought that it might be good to put in here when we met as a committee but now that we mm -hmm. kind of have slept on it and see it mm -hmm. maybe it is best if we don't have it mm -hmm. because it really is covered under in general exercise good judgment and, yeah. and I think that we're good to remove it and if everybody agrees to remove it then what we'll do is Lori and I will remove it tomorrow, and when we place this back on there, it, it's still a clean reading that this policy can then be adopted at our next meeting mm -hmm. because we've all agreed that, that this is the change that we would like to see made. So procedurally, we already have a motion to approve items two through nine. Would we have to amend that motion? Yeah, you would just have to direct us to make the appropriate change. Okay, so I could say something like, I move that policy items two through nine be added to the legislative meeting agenda with the um, Changes we the just changes discussed. to um, item seven that were previous yes. that we just discussed. All right, so I make that motion. So Second. Oh. <laughs> Any discussion? <laughs> yeah, I just want to say, uh, you know, just to give anyone some, you know, understanding of these policies, like Ms. Casera said, you know, we're just looking at the ones that are the oldest, and you know, you're looking at some from the '90s, right? So these are the things I, I often say. <laughs> they aren't the most exciting things. Right, doesn't get people's temperature going, but they're necessary, mm -hmm. right? And we're going to be moving this district forward. So um, I just wanted to thank the other members of the team. You know, it's yeah. been tough work, but <laughs> we're going to spearhead through it and uh, make it happen. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate all the work the policy committee has been doing, and I mean, policy is the primary job of the board, so yeah, it's very important. Stuff, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. The one thing too, I don't mean to cut you off. Go ahead, take the vote, then I'll say. Uh, <laughs> is, is there any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. As we said, a lot of these policies were last either adopted or it says revised in 1993. But I can assure you that these have been reviewed. And mm -hmm. um, at times, you know, in the last eight years that I've been superintendent, okay, this it, it's such a minor change that ju we're just not going to make that change right now. But what we decided to do this time is make the minor change, make those changes. But at the same time, the first item on here was that the policies that we reviewed. And so what you'll begin to see now is that we have read this policy that was from 1993. Well, yes, this is how we currently do things, and this is how we should be doing things, and this matches the standards of operation across school districts in the Commonwealth. So you're going to now see a review January 2020 on the bottom of those items that were adopted in 1993. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really going to help us to clean things up moving forward because it's not going to appear mm -hmm. as though this policy hasn't even been looked at since 1993. We've reviewed them, we've read them, 
and we've chosen to just continue to move forward with the language that it, it says that. So you will see that item number one moving forward, that this is the list of policies that the committee reviewed and agreed that no real changes were needed in them. Good point. And I think in general we've decided that every policy is going to be looked at every three years That's moving the forward. Goal, yeah. yeah, so great. It'll be nice to have that date so you know which <laughs> ones to look at. Great. Um, okay, moving along, I see we have no items under support services this evening. So I also understand we have nobody that signed up for public comments on non-agenda items. Okay, that being said, I'd like to announce that the next public meeting of the Board of Education is scheduled for Thursday, February 20th in the North Hills Middle School LGI room at 7 p.m. And I will adjourn the meeting.